Good afternoon. My name is Joe Reinhardt. I'm the delivering manager for Cisco Training Boot Camps. Have anybody ever heard of Cisco Training Boot Camps? Ah, okay. Uh, I get to lead the team that delivers all of those. And what my topic's going to be today is on Cisco ACI. And hopefully by the time we get done, maybe some things will be clear. Hopefully it won't be more confusing. All right. So I always use an agenda because otherwise I'm going to meander and ramble on every possible topic on the planet. So you don't want that to happen, believe me. So we're going to start off with, even based on my own experience, how you might view ACI. A little bit about comparing it to something we're probably already familiar with, Nexus 7000 VDCs. Anybody ever worked on VDCs? You're my friends. And then uh, we'll compare that to the way ACI does its logical constructs. I'm going to make sure that I don't mislead you so you know the differences between what I'm sharing with these is good and then we'll wrap up. Sound like a plan? All right, so let's get started. I started using ACI with the very first version of code, not like the pre-release version, but the 1.0 something. And when I first sat down in front of ACI, I felt so lost. And I couldn't quite get my head around things, and I was supposed to teach it, so it made it even more interesting. So. I came up with an acronym. We'll have a little fun with it. By the way, what does ACI stand for? Application-centric infrastructure. But it might feel like it sounds like the, it stands for this. A lot of confusing information. Different terms, different words. You hear things like forget everything you know about networking, which is not true, by the way. So it can be a little disorienting because it's not familiar. It's very, very different. But what I want to say is having spent a lot of time with ACI, it's really just the next evolution of networking. How many 10 meg Ethernet users do we have? Token ring, dial up, frame relay. You see a theme here? Technology continuously evolved, which is good because it keeps all of us employed. But sometimes it's a little bit of an uphill climb just keeping up with whatever's next. So ACI is just a representation, at least in the data center, of the evolution of technology. All right. So let's start off with something we already know, next to 7,000 VDCs. Now, when they came out, it was a revolutionary concept, the idea of being able to carve a switch up into logical switches. But it's something we take for granted a lot now. So with VDCs, you created logically separate switches that were just like they were standalone switches. In fact, you may remember when you would create VDCs, if you wanted the first VDC to talk to the second VDC, you might have to connect the ports on the same line card to get it to talk. Kind of strange at the time. But they're completely isolated logically. And you can have either four or eight, depending on what supervisor you're using. They're completely isolated from one another. As I mentioned, they have to be physically connected if they're going to communicate. And you create the VDC manually. You go into the administrative context, you go to the command line, and you do something that looks a lot like this. And once you do that, your VDCs come up. Once you allocate an interface to a VDC, can it be shared? No. Once it's in one VDC, it cannot be used by another VDC. And that's one of the things that it took a little bit of getting used to. In fact, you even get that really scary warning saying, if you do this, you're going to interrupt traffic on the ports. Once you've created the VDC, you go into the command line, you do the switch to command, and all of a sudden it's like you're in a completely separate switch. Config T. Anybody else still do config T? I do write mem too. The first thing I do in a Nexus switch is CLI alias name, WR copy run start. It's a spiritual thing for me. But you go into the device context and you create different things. VRFs, VLANs, interfaces. In this case, it's an SVI subnets, routing protocols, and even your out-of-band management IPs are created in the VDC. Pretty straightforward so far, right? One thing that we don't always think about is you can create the exact same configuration in one VDC as you have another VDC. And it doesn't matter because they don't see each other. Now, if you connect them, obviously, you could see a number of technical things, probably a couple TAC calls to get involved with that. But you can duplicate everything. 
except for the VDC name. You see my imaginative names, VDC1, VDC2. But logically, the configuration would look a little bit like this, because you're talking about all the pieces you've created in each one. And in this case, they're identical. But in a second, we're going to shift to make them different, just to illustrate the point. We could simplify the way this looks by doing this, because everything is living inside this VDC, and some of these other items live inside one another. Pretty straightforward. We've been doing this for a long time. Now, let's shift gears. I have found, at least for myself, whenever I'm dealing with something brand new and unfamiliar, I try to relate it to something I already know, which is the reason I started talking about this other stuff you already know. So now let's shift gears a little bit and start talking about ACI. First element is called a tenant. It's the master container for everything else. Have uh, any of you ever seen the, like the Russian dolls, the one that's kind of inside the other? Think about the objects in ACI like that. You got the tenants, the great big one, and you keep opening them to get smaller ones, and they're nested within one another, just like you would in a VDC. One of the things that's different, though, is you're not restricted to a single switch like you are with the Nexus 7000. But you can have it across all the switches in the fabric. Another one of those things I had a hard time getting my head around. But stop thinking of the ACI fabric as multiple switches that are interconnected. To think of it as one giant logical multi-port switch. So then you're essentially creating the equivalent of a VDC inside the ACI fabric. It does a lot of the same things. So tenant. And it's logically isolated, just like VDCs are isolated from one another. And you cannot have them talk to each other without special configuration. But I'll just tell you in advance, you can communicate through the common tenant or through VRF route leaking. But otherwise, they're not going to ever touch or talk to each other or see anything that's inside each other. And like VDCs, you could use almost exactly the same IP addresses, names, everything else, because it's contained and hidden within the tenant itself. Separate worlds. VRFs. Do you know the difference between a VRF in ACI and a VRF in NXOS? There's only one. Because it does all the other, the same things. It, it's a layer three routing instance. You can apply interfaces and just to that VRF. You can separate traffic. The only thing that's different is how it displays. So in ACI, when you create a VRF and a tenant, and you go to the CLI and type show VRF all, this is how it's going to show up. Because the tenant and the VRF are inseparably tied. So big container, tenant, next container inside VRF. This got confusing in the beginning because it was called context and private network. And my first thought was, what on earth does that mean? And then they finally called it VRF, and the light went on for me. Within the VRF, you have one or more bridge domains. What's our layer two broadcast domain in traditional networking? A VLAN. We've been doing VLAN since, well, it seems like forever. A bridge domain is a layer two broadcast domain and functions a lot like a VLAN. Now, let me just tell you in advance, they're not identical, even though they do most of the same thing. If you're going to get technical, and I suspect you do, it's a VXLAN segment. One other advice about learning ACI. Learn VXLAN first, and all the weird stuff about ACI makes a lot more sense. If you're like me and dive in right away, why are there tunnels? Why is it doing this? Why is it doing that? It seemed to break everything I knew. And then I learned VXLAN and went, oh, now I get it. So save yourself about three months worth of, of burned up brain cells. But VXLAN is used for creating layer two domains over layer three infrastructure. And it's basically the operating uh, way that ACI does things. I have a YouTube top on VXLAN if you want to look it up. Nothing else, just for a laugh, right? Just kidding. All right. Within a bridge domain, you have a subnet. When you create the subnet inside the bridge domain, it creates an SVI. It does all the other things that you're used to with SVIs. It becomes the default gateway for everything attached to that. And you can have multiple addresses. How many uh, IP addresses can you have on an interface in NXOS or iOS? Many, well, quite a few. 
if you add the secondary keyword. Otherwise, you have the added benefit of erasing the first one and probably a bunch of stuff's going to go down. Guess how I know that? But only one can be primary. And you have a toggle switch when you create the subnet on whether or not it's primary. So keep that in mind. But it does the same thing. So tenant, VRF, bridge domain, subnet. So far, it's somewhat familiar if you think about it in these terms. Already talked about that. The other thing that's interesting about subnets is it creates an AnyCast gateway on all the leaf switches in the fabric. So if you take a server and you have it on switch one, and then you just decide you want to put it on switch three later, you can pick it up. You wouldn't really pick it up, but you move it, cable it on the other side. The server seems the same MAC address and the same IP address. So what does it not have to do? There's no ARP because it's the same. It already knows the information it needs to know. This is also particularly helpful if you're doing a vMotion from an ESXi, ESXi host on one leaf switch to another. Doesn't even know that it happened. Application profile. Now this one's a little strange because it doesn't fit into our analogy very well. There's no real equivalent in the traditional networking world. It's kind of different. But really, just think of application profiles as just a container. You know, you have a great dinner, you go home, you put it in a Tupperware or something else, you put the lid on, it's a container. It's, it's holding something. And application profiles live in the bridge domain, but its sole purpose is to hold endpoint groups, which we'll talk about in just a second. So tenant, VRF, bridge domain, subnet, application profile, and I wish I had a drum roll sound effect, endpoint groups. Thank you. <laughs> like it. Thank you very much. I'm here till Thursday. Oh, wait, it is Thursday. All right. Endpoint groups are essentially, just think about endpoints as connections to the ACI fabric. It could be a physical port. It could be part of a vSwitch. It could be an external subnet if you have routing going on. Just think of it as a connection. And when you group them together, you usually have something in mind. Like, let's say you have all web servers. You put them in one endpoint group because of the behavior that you're going to have. You put your databases in another. That's kind of the way you can look at it. One thing that you frequently do is you assign a VLAN and to a port to an endpoint group to have a layer two connection, which is what, four lines of code in NXOS? It gives it a VLAN tag, in this case of 100, just as an example. So just think of this as connections, without getting too further into it. One really, really big point. EPGs, in this, all endpoints in the same EPG can talk without any restriction, which is great if that's what you want. If it's not what you want, you have two choices. Either break the other endpoints off to a different group, or you have to turn on a specific feature to keep them from talking to one another. So design is important in every network. In ACI, it's like triple in its importance because of the way things will, will, uh, will uh, the data will run correctly or incorrectly based on how you design things. So big thing there. If you want two different EPGs to talk, you need a contract. And I said that uh, bridge domain was a lot like a VLAN, and they're pretty close. But when I say that a contract is like an access list, the differences are a little bit more. But still, we're familiar with access lists. They've been around, what, since the beginning of iOS, just about. So let's look at an access list. So something really simple here. The first thing access list contains are match criteria. If you're going to pack it, you filter packets, what criteria are you going to use to match? And there's a couple there. We've got Telnet, and we've got a couple IP address ranges. So match criteria, number one. Action, pretty much permit or deny. So you have match criteria, you have actions, and then you have directionality. You apply, in this case, to an interface. Does it make a difference which direction you apply an access list to an interface? Oh, you better believe it. I've seen horrible things happen by IP address or access list being misapplied. So match criteria, actions, direction. So now let's jump over the ACI side and look at what that looks like. You have contracts. Contracts contain, but you can't guess what it is. Match criteria, but we just call them filters. And you can put as many in uh, a contract as you want based on maybe you want 
to disallow Telnet, but you want to allow SSH and web and whatever else. Then you have actions, permit, deny. See, there's not a lot, it seems a lot different, but there's more alike than different. And then you have directionality. So match criteria, actions, and then they have these what called labels, consumer and provider. Between you and me, I could never understand what they meant by consumer and provider. And I heard some great explanations. Well, this is providing the service and this is taking advantage of the service. It just was kind of like this. Might as well have been talking uh, some alien language. I didn't get it. I'm going to tell you the secret of how this works. Another drum roll, please. <laughs> Source and destination. Does how you put in your configuration for source and destination matter in an access list? You have your source ports as what you want to be as your destination ports. Traffic's not going to go anywhere. Source and destination is really just the easy way to think about this. Now, keep in mind, you wouldn't have source to source and destination to destination, right? It's always source and destination in pairs. It works the same way with ACI. Consumer and provider, you have to have that directionality in the relationship. All right, so now we're coming to toward the end of the talk, and I don't want to give you the impression that Nexus 7000 VDCs and ACI are exactly identical because there's big differences. One is a single chassis, the other is across all the switches in the network. You only get four or eight instances depending on your supervisor. You can do a lot of tenants on an ACI fabric. How many? Well, check your verified scalability design. Uh, guide because it could be software dependent or hardware dependent. But there's quite a few, way more than eight. NXOS has a default VRF. You create something, you don't put it in a VRF, guess what? It's in the default VRF. There is no concept of a default VRF in ACI. You have to create it. Otherwise, the tenant's going to sit there and have nothing in it. And by the way, you can't create the bridge domain and the subnets if you don't have the VRF. Physically separated with VDCs, Remember I talked about tenants can't communicate. You can communicate through the common tenant or VRF route leaking, but you have to have special configuration. It's a whitelist model. Distributed architecture with switches, obviously centralized architecture with ACI. How many switches run VDCs? Just the 7,000s. I remember when the 9,000 came out, I kept asking, when is it going to be supported? And it's, like, it's not currently supported, which sounded like it might be, but it's not. I thought it was a very clever phrasing. ACI only runs on the 9000 series. On unspecific models, your 9500s and your 9300s. 9200s, that's your VX LAN traditional NXOS. All right. We're, how many of you love the CLI? It's OK to admit it. Nobody's going to get in trouble. Quick bit of trivia, the CLI was not originally part of Cisco iOS devices. It was developed by Kirk Lougheed, was like employee number three, because they were at a conference kind of like this one, and they wanted to see a CLI. So he created one like that, and it's been with us ever since. And we love it. But you configure it NXOS at the CLI. This is a bit of a paradigm shift. You have to use it on the controller, because when you try to do config T on a, an ACI switch, it just doesn't laugh at you. It swears at you. So these are some of the differences in the two examples that I've been giving. All right, just wrap up some things to keep in mind. First. I freely admit, when you get into ACI, it can seem a little strange at first, because it seems to bend or break the rules of networking as we know it. There's some similarities between VDCs and ACI that can help you understand these things a little better, since they're using all different terms. ACI uses this series of logical constructs for everything related to networking, even if it's in the, com the common tenant. And the comparisons aren't exact. There's definitely some differences. Oh, and here's the thing. We're at currently version 6.x of ACI, and we're about 10 years later, so I don't think it's going away anytime soon. So it is a worthy technical area to study and master. Once you get past some of the differences in it, it can really be powerful. If you have, Vish, are you here? William? We have some VDMs from the learning community. If you have any interest in some additional coursework that you might be able to take advantage of, these would be the guys to talk to. And thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you today. It's been fun.
I hope you found this informative. Hope you have a great day and a great rest of your conference.